Cette conférence va maintenant être enregistrée. Perfect. So, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us this morning. Um, and thank you for joining us to the last Federan webinar uh, of the year. We've had many, and uh, if you're interested in our events, please uh, do check our website and our uh, event calendars. And uh, I'm happy to, to end uh, on a very interesting topic, a hot topic for the European uh, institutions and for us, of course. Uh, we've seen with the European Green Deal that uh, energy um, has to uh, is to be run as well with uh, environment initiatives and we have to take a more comprehensive approach. So this is why we are we have decided to launch this, uh, this series of webinars because uh, most of you do work on energy efficiency, renewable energy already, but maybe you're interested in, uh, in circular economy as well. So uh, I haven't presented myself yet. So for those of you who don't know me, I'm Melissa Miklas, communication officer at Federen, and Federen is the European Federation of Agencies and Regions for Energy and the Environment. Um, so let's see. Uh, this is our calendar uh, for today. So we have three uh, Federen members who will share with you their, their experience on the topic, so the energy dimension of circular economy. And for your information, this is the second webinar. We already had one on the introduction to circular economy, so it was uh, more general to really understand the topic, giving uh, definitions. We also had a rep representative of the European uh, Commission with us. Uh, and you can, of course, access uh, this first webinar as well on our website. Please uh, also do connect on Slido uh, right now because uh, during the whole webinar we will have uh, some questions for you. The first questions are just to, to make sure you're awake, you're really active and to try to, to figure out why you're here. But then you will also get questions uh, in order to test whether you listen to our speakers. So please connect now because they will have, uh, there will be some uh, questions right now. So I will do it as well, of course. We are right now 28, so I hope to have uh, 28 or almost 28 answers to the first question. Just a really basic question. Uh, I like to, to ask this one to, to see who is with us in the, in the audience. So the code is EDCE for energy dimension of circular economy. Great. You are very fast this morning, so I'm really happy. Maybe we have a small crowd, but you're all really uh, active and awake. 16, that's already pretty good. 18, let's see. So this is no surprise. Uh, this is basically the main tar target groups of Federen, Federen events and activities. Uh, we have a lot of public authorities, I'm guessing local and regional level, energy agencies some NGOs, a few private companies, and I didn't forget any, any of the groups, apparently. So again, welcome to all and thank you for being here. Then a second question to start making you think about the topic, why we're here today. I think this one came from our speaker Thomas yesterday when we were speaking. So what is the link between energy and circular economy? You can give one or two words, the main one, according to you. Um, this is the kind of brainstorming to, to launch the topic. And you can, uh, I think yeah, I allowed multiple answers. So if you have different ideas, you can go ahead and, and write them down. Okay, resource, that's a good one. Resilience, sustainability, of course. That's an interesting uh, word cloud, I think. Definitely help, helps us uh, launch the discussion. Let's see, energy use in transports, local behavior, true as well. energy transition, of course. That's always our main goal behind 
every action, every event, mitigation. Okay, the number of participants is rising both on the webinar and on Slido, so I'm very happy. Thank you very much and welcome to the new ones who have joined us. I think I will I will close it here. Thank you for uh, for your support. And we will now move to our first speaker. You can already see her on the screen. It is Auti Pakarinen. So Auti actually helped us with the organization of this series of webinars because Central Finland, the organization she represents, has always been one of the most active members and one of the experts on the topic uh, in the Federal Network. And Auti is working as acting, acting development manager in bioeconomy. So, Auti, thank you for being here today, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Melissa, and nice to be here again. I have the same title in my presentation as in as in first webinar, but some of the slides are at least have been changed. <laughs> so don't worry, it won't be the totally the same presentation. Ah. I was too quick. So first, a short description of the circular economy, what it means. Uh, most of you are probably very well aware of the, of the meaning of the circular economy. Uh, this has been taken from the Eurostat uh, web page, the definition, and in that figure you can also see the um, relation of the energy and material flows so the connection between the circular economy and energy energy related issues is quite clear biomass metals minerals and fossil fuels are extracted from the environment and used to make products or to produce energy. And it, of course, generates some emissions, some waste, and some of these material flows are then uh, recirculated, uh, which, uh, which is then as a part of circular economy. In general, in the global perspective, uh, global economy use 90, three billion tons of materials every year and only nine percent of these material flows are circular so we have a lot of possibilities to improve improve this number together then we go to finland about the waste generated and how we are creating for example the municipal solid waste the municipal solid waste the waste which is uh, generated from households and services is about three percent of the total waste amount generated in finland uh, biggest proportion of the waste comes from mining sector uh, also quite big proportion comes from construction sector. Uh, in the right, you can see uh, how we create the municipal solid waste in Finland. And currently, uh, almost 0% goes to the landfills. We have uh, managed to decrease the amount of landfill municipal solid waste in recent uh, years quite much. Uh, but you can also see that the material recovery has not increased that much since 2003. Instead of in increasing material recovery, uh, we, have, um, we have shifted from landfilling to energy recovery of the waste so waste is incinerated and used to produce heat and electricity. And then to those of you who were in the first webinar, I presented 
a little bit about the Cirque Waste project and Cirque Waste roadmap that we have made for our region, Central Finland. Uh, Central Finland, the size of our region uh, is about half of the size of the Netherlands. And in Netherlands, there is 17 million people living. We have less than 300,000. We are producing about 2 million tons of waste every year. Uh, this has been calculated in 2018. And biggest proportion of our waste stream is the construction and demolition waste. And based on this uh, regional data, we have selected four uh, main development themes what comes to the waste uh, management and circular economy. And those are listed there. Um, what comes to construction and demolition waste and how it is related to energy is that it's a big proportion of that waste in Finland is wood-based uh, waste streams. And currently uh, we are mainly incinerating that waste to generate heat and electricity. However, if we really want to reach our recycling targets, we need to improve the material recovery. That has been already started, but there is a lot of work to do in our region and in Finland in general. And the same issue uh, fits with the plastics also. Uh, currently, the, there has been a strong increase in the recycling rate of the plastics in Finland, but still a lot of plastics goes to the uh, in mixed municipal solid waste and they goes to the incineration and energy recovery instead of the material recovery. So we have a lot of work to do, for example, how to improve the source separation of these different waste materials already or in the household. And then the biogas and this waste electrical and electronic equipment, those also have links to the energy sector. Uh, in central Finland, we have also made a survey or ordered a survey of the energy, con uh, energy production and energy consumption in our region. These results are just preliminary and we will get the final results from the, um, by the end of this year. But however, from this figure, you can see that we have quite high renewable energy production, wood energy, black liquor, and also part of the imported electricity contains renewable energy, but still oil, coal, and peat are the fossil fuels, which we really need to get rid of. And what comes to the energy uh, use in different sectors, the road transport is the hardest one to decarbonize. And then a few words about the peat. Uh, in our region, there is peat, pro peat production, and we are also using peat for energy production. And we are making the just transition plan for our region. Uh, and it, it takes into account that when we are decreasing the peat production and also the peat energy use, it has a negative effect on regional economy because it gives us employment and also the tax incomes. So we need to think about how we find new jobs for those people that work in peat production and in the value chain and how we will also replace the peat in energy production and that work we have already started even if we are not yet quite certain that we will be part of this uh, just transition fund mechanism but anyway we will need to work on this topic and one solution that has um, has raised in the discussion is the biogas production. That could it be a solution uh, to replace peat? 
And in the first webinar, uh, I presented some of the examples of our region, how we have promoted biogas production and consumption. And currently less than 10% of the biogas potential is in use. So we can improve the biogas potential quite heavily in our region. However, even if we reach that potential, it will cover maybe one third of the energy content of the peat that we are currently using. So we will still need other solutions. But of course, this could give us uh, uh, em employment and uh, makes this money circulate in our own region. So to improve, improve regional economy. And some other examples of the energy and material flows, how they, uh, how they connect. Uh, as you know, the carbon dioxide is also produced when, when burning or incinerating biomass and fossil fuels and waste, for example. This carbon dioxide can be captured and converted to fuels and chemicals. And we have know-how and research on this, this topic also in our region, in VTT and in University of Uvascula. And one of the uh, biogas company ha that has been quite long in this, uh, working in this sector, this Metener, they are also piloting the carbon dioxide conversion. In together with this VTT. And the other side product that comes from energy production when bur burning or incinerating different kind of fuels is the ash. And we also have one company that has um, developed the solution for this, this side stream and they are producing fertilizers and earthwork materials. It's this Ecolan company working in our region as well. And then I showed you the Circways roadmap with the main, uh, with the four main themes. With the, one of those themes was waste, electronic and electric equipments. Uh, from the University of Uvascula and the chemistry department, they have uh, spinned off a company called WeFine and they've developed a th um, 3D printed scavengers with which they can recover precious metals from different waste fractions. For example, from this uh, waste electronic and electric equipments and also from other uh, waste materials, uh, waste waste waters and so on. And when the, uh, it has been estimated that uh, when energy sector goes strongly to elec electricity and also the traffic sector uh, is going to be more and more electric in the future, the need for these met metals will be much higher than it's currently. And in Europe, we don't have much um, uh, production of these metals. We are quite dependent, for example, from China. And when we can, uh, when we can uh, collect these metals from different waste streams and recycle them, we can improve our uh, security of supply of these very important, very important. Uh, raw materials for the, for the energy sector. And this is almost the same as in the first webinar. When you are promoting circular economy in your region, uh, you should know very well what kind of uh, what kind of region you are working on. You should know the energy material and waste flows, and take take all the stakeholders to work together for this common, common goal 
uh, research development organizations and the companies that want to grow and find uh, some greener solutions are very important in my opinion. And in short, the circular economy should be less material consumption, less waste, less emissions, but improved regional economy at the same time. And here is some further reading if you are interested and uh, please, I'm very uh, happy to answer if you have any questions now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Auti, for this interesting presentation. Uh, and for participants, of course, you will receive the slides afterwards, so you will be able to, to read all of these uh, great materials during your Christmas break, maybe. <laughs> Let's be optimistic. Uh, before we we have uh, the the Q and A after Auti's presentation, uh, I have prepared a slide of question again to see if you were listening. So let's have it now. According to the 2019 circular circularity gap report presented on the first slide, I think by Auti, how much of the global economy is circular? Is it seven percent, nine percent? or 12%. That's a hard one. Also the the percentages are uh, are close with each other but uh, anyway even if you get it wrong I think that's a the question a good is not thing coming. to remember. The question is not coming on Slido. You don't see it? No. I see it. I see it. Okay. Let me check again. Thank you for informing me. Uh, okay. So you have to click on polls. Maybe you were on Q&A and then type your name and then you have the question. Yes, you have to be careful. There are two sections on Slido if you're on your uh, smartphone like mine, either Q&A or polls, do you see it now, Dominique? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's because you have to put your name first. Yes, indeed. So how many answers do we have? 17, I think we had uh, 20 last time, but we have more participants. So let's aim for at least 20 answers. Um, some of you arrived during Auti's presentation, so Please, as I said to the first ones, join us now on Slido. There will be several questions throughout the webinar. You can also ask your questions to speakers in Slido. I will both check Slido and, uh, and the chat. Okay. So let's end it here. I think it, that's enough. So let's see. 76% of you had the right answer. So. Congratulations, Auti. You were apparently very uh, interesting for our audience. It is correct. It is 9% 9 per, 9 according to this report, at least, because as we were discussing with Auti yesterday, maybe another report will give another number. But uh, more or less, anyway, what we have to learn, I guess, from this number is that it's still very low and there is a lot of progress to make. So thank you very much. And before we go to the next presentation, uh, we can still take uh, one or, or two questions for Auti, otherwise you will be also able to ask them uh, at the end of the of the webinar. I do have some questions too, but I want to to first give the the opportunity to our audience. Otherwise, I think I will keep my questions for for the end, if that's okay. Let's see, no question on Slido, and no question on the chat yet. So feel free to, to ask them whenever, uh, write them down during the presentations and I can take them uh, at the end of each presentation, of course. All right, um, let's move then to the, the second presentation and we'll come back on um, questions and answers and discussion with Auti at the end of this webinar. Thank you again, Auti, for this presentation. 
Pema, you were the first one to, to answer correctly the question, so congratulations to you. And actually, <laughs> you're next, so that's a good transition. So, uh, Thomas uh, Emerdinger is Project Officer for Circular Economy and Energy Transition at the Paris Region Institute. So, he's the perfect person to, uh, to explain us the link between uh, those two topics. So, please go ahead, Thomas. Uh, thank you, Melissa. Um, Auti has already uh, uh, speak a lot, a lot of things, so I will try to to make it further. So we all know the challenges of energy transition, namely uh, reducing the fossil fuels, fossil fuels consumption, and developing uh, renewable energies. And circular economy has already been defined during the first webinar. Remembering these two main objectives which are the preservation of uh, non-renewable resources and the reduction of pollution of any kind, we can see that we can say that energy transition more or less meets the objectives of a circular economy. But the two respond to each other on several aspects, such as the development of biogas. However, several elements must, must be uh, nuanced because circular economy calls for a, a systemic vision of uh, resources. Up. So, what is the urban metabolism? Um, it's a balance of an analysis of the flow and stock of materials and energy necessary for the functioning of a territory. We will look at all the flow of resources like uh, water, energy, food, uh, raw materials, and uh, the externalities like pollution um, and waste. We will see also at the stocks, that is to say the natural resources or secondary resources that, uh, that are contained in the urban stock, which can replace imported non-renewable non oh, non resources. For example, uh, construction waste or, uh, or waste uh, heat. Uh, with this, we can we can go uh, from a linear metabolism city to a circular metabolism city. Yep. And, um, so Auti uh, said it before, but it's a scientific approach all around the world. Uh, in Europe, we have the Eurostat uh, method. And uh, there is a, a big uh, scientific cooperation. It's called the uh, metabolism of cities. And there is a lot of cities um, uh, which have uh, their urban metabolism. And uh, we can see uh, the data on this uh, website. It's, um, it's uh, there is a link uh, if we click, uh, if you click uh, on this. As part as a, as a, as part of the regional circular economy strategy, we have made a urban metabolism for the Paris region. So using the uh, the Eurostat method, what does uh, our metabolism tell us? First of all, like all cities, the Paris region is highly dependent on external re supplies of resources, and much, most of which are non-renewable, including uh, fossil fuels. The second, um, the second thing is that uh, the consumption levels are very, very high. We we are uh, twelve, uh, we are twelve million uh, inhabitants, and uh, this level of consumption have a very high impact on the environment, in the air, the water, and soil, like the greenhouse gases, on the the waste uh, deposit. Uh, this means that the main stake is indeed the reduction of demand by effort of uh, sufficiency and efficiency in all areas, like um, energy, of course, but also food, materials, uh, water. Um, and this is the first point of uh, convergence between a circular economy and energy transition. Uh, this uh, urban metabolism tells us that the local production of energy, agriculture, or construction materials remains uh, marginal compared to our needs. Even if it's not known, we have a small local extraction of oil and gas uh, and an increasing production of biogas injected into the networks or used for vehicles. And finally, the, the recycling shares 
and recovery remains low compared with the quantity the quantities uh, the quantities of uh, resources consumed recycling could never meet all of the needs even if it uh, can significantly contribute to them Up. one of the oh sorry Up. Voilà. The, the other thing that uh, human metabolism tells us is the external, externalization of our resources footprint. As with the greenhouse gases, the majority of our resources consumption is not produced on our territory because we have a low extraction capacity and we have a, a, a deindustrialization since uh, several, several years. Um, for example, if we if we look at fossil fuels uh, consumption, our consumption, our direct consumption is uh, 1.2 per inhabitant per year. And if we look and we integrated the integrate the indirect uh, flows, we we reach 3.4 uh, tons per inhabitant per year for just fossil fuels. So we can see that we are in fact nearly tripling our real dependence of fossil fuels. This finding pleads for taking energy transition into account beyond our energy mix, for example, by integrating it into a public procurement, for example. If we look at uh, renewable energy, because it, it can, uh, of course, reduce the consumption of non-renewable energies and develop production from local resources. So it's a, it's a very important in circular economy, but we can nuance uh, it uh, with um, a larger vision of uh, and systemic vision of uh, resources. So first of all, um, uh, renewable energies can um, consume land uh, as their production is directly proportional to the land used. They can also consume uh, rare and strategic metals and uh, also need big uh, amounts of constru construction materials like concrete, which have a, a very important grey energy. Uh, they can also develop rebounds, uh, effects or conflict of use with other uh, resources such as uh, the, bi the biomass, the fight against uh, the land artificialization or the total consumption of uh, resources. The International Resource Panel, equivalent uh, to the IPCC but much uh, less uh, well known, carried out a study, so, so you can see here, um, carried out a study on the impacts in terms of consumption of soil, of resources and uh, land, uh, for several electricity uh, generation technologies, and we, you you can see, so it's 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 in French, but uh, the study is uh, is uh, available in English. You you can see that uh, renewable energies consume a lot of resources, and uh, so it must be uh, taken in, into account. Also. Uh, for the, regio re the regional biomass uh, scheme, we have carried out two studies on wood, wood and straw potential, which are highly regarded for biomass energy or bio-based bio uh, construction in, uh, in the Paris region, because uh, these two resources are very uh, important in our, in our region. These two studies assess the complementarities or potential confl conflicts of use. And finally, we can see an incoherence uh, between circular economy and energy transition that uh, Auti already said. It's on waste energy recovery. Uh, because um, we all know the, the, the pyramid of uh, waste management. This called for a better repair, reuse and recycling, and uh, especially material recycling. And um, we have uh, we have also a very a very important part of uh, waste energy recovery in our region, uh, higher than in uh, Finland because, uh, for example, um, the public waste uh, are treated like uh, for 80 percent in our region. It's very big. We have a fleet of uh, 18 incinerators for all the Paris region, and it 
and in the, it's uh, one of the main sources of renewable or recovery energy in, uh, in uh, our region. It's uh, producing four terawatt terawatts out of uh, 18 terawatts only for renewable energy because uh, the energy consumption is uh, around uh, two, um, uh, 220 uh, terawatts. And it's a strong debate uh, in uh, our region, and it can be seen uh, during public inquiries for uh, internal incinerator extension, for example. So what we do to answer these uh, challenges and uh, very difficult uh, question, we 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 do several actions in the into the, these two fields of uh, circular economy and energy transition. First of all, we we have a, a big action of uh, questioning the needs because uh, it's a, the first step for us is the first step of cir uh, a real circular economy and a real uh, energy transition. So we we work on uh, ener energy suffi uh, sufficiency also with uh, Federen. Uh, for example, yesterday we had a, a, web, a webinar uh, on this uh, main uh, subject. Uh, we support energy renovation, uh, especially in, uh, in public uh, buildings or in, uh, in private uh, habitats. Uh, we work on a, a low-tech urbanism uh, toolbox in uh, 2021. Uh, and we work also on uh, carbon neutrality. Uh, for the Paris region, which is uh, very difficult. Uh, also, like uh, other energy uh, agencies, uh, we, we develop uh, local renewable uh, energies with uh, uh, several uh, actions. First of all, it's uh, the energy observatory, the ROSE. Uh, we improve the knowledge of uh, local, local potentials to have the, the better uh, renewable energy according to uh, our territory. And we work also on uh, two um, renewable gas gases like the, the biogas, of course, with a new uh, with a new uh, professional network. And we we also uh, begin a hydrogen uh, Paris region club to accelerate uh, this uh, this solution for for circular economy and energy transition. Also, we support local uh, authorities for circular economy with a community of circular cities, because, uh, for example, Paris, Paris uh, have, um, have a climate, climate and energy plan and also a, a circular uh, strategy. We work on studies and guides uh, on circular economy in several uh, aspects, like uh, construction, urban planning, or uh, public procurement. And, uh, and last, but like uh, Auti said, we, Im we try to improve knowledge on the systemic vision of resources, for example, of, uh, on the material flow analysis and the data. We, we seek all the data we can, uh, we can uh, have. Uh, we work on a resources observatory. It's the first time in France. Uh, it's, a, um, it's a government uh, called uh, like two years ago for, for the region to have a resources observatory, uh, to go further that, than uh, only the West uh, Observatory or the Energy obs Observatory. And uh, with this, we, we want to, to study the, the, uh, the use conflicts, the synergy, the potential uh, synergy, and the rebound effects that uh, can, can, can be appeared. In conclusion, we can see uh, a lot of convergence, but also the divergence between the two subjects. And uh, of course, it's only uh, our vision, but uh, in, it can be improved uh, by uh, it changing. Uh, uh, all, um, so first of all, the, the first convergence is uh, um, the, the most important for, for us is, uh, of course, the, the reduction of, uh, of uh, our energy consumption and, of course, the, foss uh, the fossil fuels. But we can see that uh, the renewable energies must be in, uh, have a, a nuanced uh, vision. Uh, of course, we will look at uh, a better valoriz valoriz valorization of uh, local resources. Uh, 
uh, but we have um, we have to look uh, also the, the waste energy recovery because circular economy calls for better prevention of waste and so the the, the energy recovery uh, can be reduced with this um, we will seek also uh, to to improve uh, regional economy by uh, of course a better or bigger production uh, on the territory so we must um, we must uh, work uh, about uh, local accept acceptability especially in the in the 12 million uh, people region it's a big big subject uh, so we we can uh, already said this the rebounds effect and the use conflicts and um, with this with a better local production we will limit the externality uh, of the impacts of extraction because of course uh, the most of the uh, of the extraction is in uh, Africa is in China uh, other countries or other regions in uh, France for example for food uh, a big thing, uh, I think, in the, our region is the land use and the consumption of resources because uh, the land is maybe the the most valuable uh, resources in uh, in our region. Uh, everyone uh, wants to to have land, for, of course, and uh, for for a lot of uh, functions. And of course, the the the, the last but not least uh, convergence is the uh, efforts on uh, energy efficiency and sufficiency. Um, so thank you. I wanted to apologize myself because uh, I, I wanted to apologize because it's been a long time that I haven't spoken in English. So. I hope that you understood uh, me, and uh, if you, if you are interested in circular economy in the Paris region, we have uh, published uh, not rapid. It's a um, it's a quick uh, uh, a quick summary of uh, of uh, a big work on uh, of uh, on uh, your bad metabolism, and it's uh, available in in English. And uh, the infograph the infographic and um, of the urban metabolism is uh, available in English. So, uh, so, so here it is, and thank you for for your attention. Thank you. Many thanks, Thomas, for this interesting and very rich presentation. I personally understood everything, uh, <laughs> but I hope uh, <laughs> maybe it's because I speak French too. No, I'm pretty sure it was it was very clear and a lot of uh, interesting things here. So. Um, before we come into the questions again, I have prepared a slide of questions for you guys. I did somewhere. Let me just check. Maybe I removed it. Where is it? It's okay. It's here. Apologies for that. I will move it to the right spot. <laughs> this happens live with webinars. All right. So Thomas has spoken about urban metabolism a few times. So what would be your definition in one or two words? There is no right or wrong. It's a word cloud again. Uh, I know it can be uh, tricky, but uh, really what is the first words that come to mind when you try to explain urban meta metabolism? Let's see, six answers, so we will wait a little longer. I will also do it myself. Okay, we have flows. So that's uh, an element from the definition. So again, we can see people paid attention. 11 answers, so I'll wait a little longer. 
as I said, there is no right or wrong, so don't be shy. I guess this concept is also new for a lot of people. It was surely for me. So it's good to, to really think about it and see how we can uh, implement it. Thomas, what would you say uh, about the answers that you see in front of you? Is it what you wanted the audience to, uh, to take from your presentation? Yes, it's uh, exactly it. So uh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> good luck, everyone. Then we have a really uh, we have good pupils in our class in our virtual class today. <laughs> okay, I'm checking if we have some questions because we will uh, we can take one or two questions really fast. But I see I have a comment from Piotr today. Uh, who is saying is working around two Polish mid-sized projects for neutral transformation of city districts neighborhoods including hydrogen how can we use run start potential cooperation between us maybe Tom I can can help mm. hydrogen uh, I, th I think it's a uh, very high potential in the uh, in a circular economy or local circular economy because we we will try to 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 produce it from local resources and not imported uh, hydrogen from uh, fossil fuels so i think it's a it's a good uh, it's a good uh, cooperation because um, uh, hydrogen is a uh, is a uh, on the on the spot we can we can see uh, with a lot of uh, billions uh, on the table uh, all around the Europe, so uh, I, I think it's a good idea. Good idea. We we have a, a lot of projects in the Paris region, for example, on uh, on uh, mobility, with a large fleet of uh, taxis uh, using with uh, uh, hydrogen. It's uh, the the bigger fleet in uh, in all around the world with uh, 120 uh, vehicles. And maybe um, to help further, Piotr, can you tell us how you started the Hydrogen Club in the Paris region? Any good advice on where to start? Uh -huh. Because I guess uh, well, that's, a, that's always the problem, to start. To start, uh, yes. Uh, good morning uh, to everybody. Um, uh, I would like just uh, ask about potential cooperation because um, you, you have you have some some experience um, and based on your experience I would like just uh, maybe talk uh, later. Uh, uh, I, I will leave you my my business contacts because the cities are currently investing in the hydro hydrogen um, um, solution within the city, but. Actually, they also um, start some some um, early stage of conception for for uh, neighborhood uh, uh, into direction where 2030 2015 um, uh, some kind of benchmark will be also a very important goal to achieve zero energy and zero emission approach within that kind of developments so i would like just ask for potential cooperation yeah for the for these two projects because the experience and sharing experience and cooperation on the international level is in my opinion very very crucial and very uh key uh important uh aspect to, to successful in delivering this kind of project not only technology but experience thank you thank you piotr um well just i want to go back as you can see there is always uh, usually the the contacts also of the speakers and uh, every time i hear that the speakers were contacted after one of our webinars it always uh, it was always a good sign for us. So thank you for your intervention. And thank you again, Thomas, for your presentation. Now it's time to move to our third speaker and presentation. Um, so we have Mathieu Schmidt here with us. Mathieu is a project leader for biomethanization at Valbium, a fellow Belgian. Uh, 
from the so Valbium is a non-profit organization which stimulates and facilitates the realization of sustainable initiatives integrating the production of biomass and its transformation into energy and materials so the first two speakers have already mentioned biogas but now Mathieu will really uh, go into detail on the topic so thank you very much Mathieu to be here today and you have the floor thank you Melissa um, so hi everyone um, okay, I got the mouse. Okay, uh, so yes, as um, Melissa said, the uh, two previous speakers uh, have uh, spoken uh, a little uh, bit about biogas, uh, but I will propose you to discover some figures of a study we realized on behalf of gas.be. Uh, gas.be is a federation of uh, gas uh, grid uh, managers. Uh, so transmission and uh, distribution. Uh, of course, gas players are uh, interested in um, communicating uh, about the uh, biogas potentials uh, as uh, their future depends on, uh, on, on that, uh, as simple as that. Uh, so we have uh, studied biomethane potential in uh, Belgium, that means uh, the, the figures I will show you are uh, really about uh, biogas as general, uh, not depending on the way of uh, valorizing it. So that means biogas for electricity production, uh, but also biogas for uh, upgrading to biomethane and uh, injection into gas grids. Um, okay. So uh, maybe a reminder because um, for the non-experts in renewable gases, it's a little bit confusing because there are many uh, renewable gases. You might hear about syngas, about biogas, about biomethane, about e-gas, e-fuel, uh, about gasification, about uh, power to gas. So at the end, I, I really believe, uh, I really feel many people uh, get lost into that. Uh, so, a short reminder, uh, different pathways to renewable gases. The first one, and this is the one I focus on, is the anaerobic digestion. So, that means uh, the gas that we can uh, produce from uh, fermentation processes. Um, so, the so-called anaerobic digestion, which is uh, happening, uh, taking place into digesters, which are basically tanks, uh, big tanks, uh, and most times uh, they are located into uh, farms. Uh, this anaerobic digestion process produces biogas, and biogas is essentially composed uh, of uh, methane, and methane, CH4, is the main component of natural gas. Natural gas is 90 to 95 percent methane uh, composed, uh, and with biogas we get also carbon dioxide. Um, so, uh, as itself, this biogas could uh, be used already into a cogeneration unit. That means producing electricity and uh, heat, uh, but also it can go into a gas upgrading uh, system, and this gas upgrading system uh, uh, plays a role to separate essentially the carbon dioxide and to remove it. And so once we have uh, made a, a breeding, we get carbon dioxide uh, released to the atmosphere and uh, methane. Sometimes I get the question about this carbon dioxide released into the atmosphere, uh, but don't forget this is uh, what we call endogenous uh, carbon dioxide. That means this carbon was uh, a few months uh, before uh, uh, captured by plants uh, from the atmosphere. So it's not uh, uh, an, an, an excess uh, release of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And so we get finally renewable methane, which can be, uh, of course, injected into the grid uh, and replace uh, the gas that you might use into your uh, domestic boilers for heating your, uh, your houses. Um, but also it can be, for example, compressed uh, to be used into cars, into what we call compressed natural ga uh, gas. Uh, and, and, and so uh, there are multiple ways to use it. Uh, you might also uh, hear about gasification. So this is generally more uh, used for dry biomass. Uh, 
Uh, meanwhile, anaerobic digestion is mainly used for wet biomass. Uh, this gasification process uh, produces what we call syngas. Syngas is composed by methane also, but not only. Also, uh, it's, com it's, it's composed by uh, carbon, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, and uh, hydrogen. This uh, and finally, uh, the last uh, gas you might hear about, uh, also called e gas, I think it's a power to gas system. So when we talk about uh, wind power or solar pa power, uh, the main issue with these technologies is about intermittency of the production, and that's why there is uh, an interest to transform uh, the excess uh, electricity into hydrogen by electrolysis. Uh, that means you get uh, hydrogen. After that, uh, once you get hydrogen, uh, you need to be able to transport it and to use it. Uh, as uh, the grids uh, are not existing, uh, there is a possibility of transforming this hydrogen into methane through a methanation process and transform this hydrogen into methane. And so uh, to be able to uh, use the gas uh, grid that is already existing. So uh, the numbers I will uh, talk to you uh, are only uh, concerning anaerobic digestion uh, ways. Uh, and uh, there are also studies uh, talking about uh, the potential of uh, hydrogen uh, from electricity, for example. So the number, uh, the main number in Belgium. So we have made a, a study. Uh, how do we uh, calculate that? Uh, we consider first the existing waste. Uh, these existing waste are uh, essentially from agriculture. And uh, you will see with uh, the, the, the multiple uh, waste that can be uh, used that uh, biogas might be maybe the biggest uh, possible contributor to circular economy and to local circular economy. Uh, because it uses, uh, for example, uh, agricultural waste, which can be manures, of course, but also food waste, uh, crop residues like straws and, and other types. Then uh, we can add some possible uh, production, uh, additional uh, production. Uh, for those that are close to agriculture, we uh, talk a lot about double crops, and especially in, in France, uh, where uh, biomethane development is very strong, but also in Italy, for example. Uh, the idea is to, to uh, grow uh, a crop uh, without competing uh, with the food and feed industry. Uh, and so uh, you uh, would use a land when uh, no crop is, uh, is uh, is, is, is on uh, during some uh, months, for example, after the wheat uh, harvest uh, in mid-July or uh, beginning of August, and to use August uh, un until uh, November, October, November, for example. And so to get an, an additional biomass uh, availability for uh, energy production. Um, then we get a theoretical improved potential, so improved uh, because of uh, the biomass that could be developed. But then we need to estimate and to avoid uh, what, uh, for example, Thomas has talked about, uh, the uh, competition. Uh, and, and so, for example, the straw is already used uh, in some extent. Uh, some straw is left on the field to, uh, to allow, uh, let's say, soil uh, regeneration. Uh, and some straw is used for uh, uh, animal breeding. Uh, so we cannot use all the available, uh, all, all the straw that is existing. So we will uh, apply some uh, utilization rate uh, coefficient, uh, depending essentially on technical, environmental, and agronomical criteria. Um, and then uh, we get what we call potential, uh, which is uh, realistic. Uh, we have located this uh, potential on a, a map of Belgium. And then we have um, compared that to uh, the consumption, the gas uh, existence uh, and the gas consumption in different areas to estimate uh, the, the share of uh, biogas that could be injected on the gas grids. 
and then we finally get the part of injectable biomethane. Uh, I will uh, give you the number only about uh, general biogas and not uh, specifically uh, biomethane that could be injected. Uh, this is essentially of interest of the, the gas players. Uh, so the number now is uh, is 15.6 uh, uh, approximately terawatt hours. Um, this is the total potential of biogas in Belgium. So to give you an idea, that is almost 10% of natural gas consumption in Belgium. Uh, I should, um, so some might think, okay, it's uh, unfortunately only uh, nine ten percent of the total consumption uh, but you should uh, also consider the belgian uh, specific context uh, which is a high uh, natural gas consumption in belgium per inhabitant compared to other uh, european countries uh, and also uh, you should not forget that uh, belgium is a country uh, with uh, let's say a high population density uh, which is about, to give an example, three to four times more than in, in France or in Spain, uh, for example. Uh, and that, uh, of course, means that the uh, agricultural surface uh, per inhabitant is uh, pretty low uh, compared to other countries. To give you very simple figures, in Belgium, there is uh, 1,000 square meter per inhabitant as a total agricultural surface. That's why um, uh, at the end, the total potential uh, would hardly uh, cover the natural gas uh, consumption. But also you should uh, not forget that uh, natural gas consumption will decrease uh, as its essential use is into uh, residential uh, heating and the uh, insulation, uh, uh, insulating uh, measures uh, and development into these uh, households. Uh, will decrease the gas uh, needs. Um, what is the share between the two regions? It is, let's say, equilibrated between Wallonia and uh, Flanders. And uh, here is uh, the map, but I see the, the graph doesn't move. It's supposed to move on the left side. But anyway, you should, uh, you should see the, the map when the blue is, let's say, darker. That means uh, the potential is more concentrated. And this map is very uh, important and useful for us uh, as uh, we will, uh, we are now in, into the process of proposing a strategy for developing and exploiting better the biogas potential. So we need to identify in the map where is the, the potential essentially, uh, because in some agricultural areas, we will go for, let's say, extensive uh, biogas plants model, uh, in some others more intensive. And so uh, that will really uh, draw, that will really help designing uh, the way to, uh, the best way to develop uh, biogas and, and, and getting the most possible benefits, uh, for example, about GAG uh, reduction. Okay. So you see in the map uh, some uh, circles that uh, have appeared, showing, for example, the, the right one uh, is uh, corresponding to a uh, a main crops uh, area very uh, known uh, in Belgium and the other circle at the left side correspond for example to a very intensive breeding pigs and chicken essentially uh, uh, farm types uh, uh, and so that could mean another type of biogas development so what is uh, yeah see there are uh, a few um, a problem with the drawing but okay it's possible to to read it uh, so what is made of this potential uh, it's essentially two-thirds of west and one-third of crops uh, i uh, should say immediately because this crop word uh, could create confusion uh, this is not uh, energy crops uh, what is energy crops uh, considered uh, now it's Generally, it's a dedicated crop, so a crop that is really uh, created, let's say, grown for energy purpose, uh, but also um, uh, taking the place of the main crop on the field. Uh, that means uh, a, a double crop, as I explained before, uh, intermediate cropping is not considered uh, really as energy crop. 
so into my uh, crop, uh, which is 37%, there is no uh, energy crops uh, into that. It is essentially uh, uh, double cropping. And uh, we have uh, West, uh, which is uh, the biggest part. If I go more into detail, uh, you can see uh, a, a share. Uh, you can see the menus uh, uh, are a, a big uh, element. Uh, you can see uh, the organic municipal solid West. Uh, this is the, the brown one. Uh, is uh, a, a low share. So many times, uh, maybe because a bit of journalists, um, uh, people believe that uh, organic municipal solid waste uh, would really uh, play a huge uh, role uh, into the renewable gas production. But okay, it's it's a good thing to to take on uh, on board, but it's not uh, the main point. Uh, agriculture uh, represents uh, so the, the, the circles should be of course on agricultural uh, substrates, uh, feedstocks. Agriculture at the end owns 80% uh, of the total potential and the other 20% are on a municipal, uh, essentially municipal uh, waste. Uh, that means agriculture has to be the support of any biogas massive development. There is no way to, uh, let's say, avoid that. And that is a good news because we are looking for circular economy. We are looking for uh, supporting and maintaining rural areas. Uh, employment into uh, rural areas, uh, diversification for revenues for agriculture, uh, uh, for farmers, uh, and biogas uh, can uh, really uh, contribute hardly to uh, these uh, objectives. And so uh, this is uh, why biogas also has some uh, importance into the agricultural uh, the common uh, policy. Uh, which is now being uh, uh, newly uh, written. And uh, that's all for that. I could uh, speak uh, a lot more, so don't hesitate if you have uh, questions and uh, I will be happy to answer them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mathieu, for your presentation. Uh, that was really great to have uh, all the, the graphics at the beginning to make me really understand finally what it was and I'm also happy to see I'm in a high intensity crop region in Liège. Uh, so now we come to the final Slido question. So please, one last time, connect to Slido. Also, you can still ask questions uh, to Slido afterwards for the discussion. Um, this question comes from Mathieu, actually. Do you believe biogas should be part of the energy transition? To see if, I guess, this presentation inspired you and you would like to replicate, if we can do it in Belgium with a very high density of people and not so many uh, agricultural lands, I guess we can do it in most countries. So I don't see why not, but uh, we're open to a discussion. So let's see. Twelve answers. Let's wait a little bit longer. Sixteen. All right. Well, I think the results are pretty clear. So, uh, Mathieu, again, you can be uh, proud of yourself. Your presentation inspired yeah, I'm, I'm, the audience. I'm happy to see that. Thank you again, uh, Mathieu. And uh, I will ask now all the speakers to uh, to turn on their um, the webcams for the um, for the final discussion and Q and A session. And I see we already have two questions on Slido. Uh, to remind you, you can ask them on Slido, but also through the chat. Uh, 
so let's start actually with the the second question here on the screen uh, following directly uh, Mathieu's presentation so for Mathieu how do you trace renewable gases such as biomethane in the grid yes um, yeah that's a good question so biomethane I mean uh, by mean of measurement or sensors is not possible to be traced once it's uh, injected into the grid uh, there is a, a flow meter control uh, before injection to measure how much was injected at some production point and a, a system of guarantee of origin, uh, one uh, or, or let's say green certificate is delivered and uh, this is uh, what the system relies on. Thank you very much. Second question is for Thomas. With your focus on local, what role do each of the arrondissements have? How geographically uh, I think we have uh, two two scales. The first is uh, the reg uh, the regional scale because uh, it's uh, the only scale we have uh, data for circular economy for a big uh, vision of circular economy for. Uh, because most of the data uh, are available at the uh, regional or departmental at, uh, lower uh, scale in France uh, because the statistic um, the statistic data are only available on this uh, on this uh, scale and the second level is uh, local that means uh, the city or the uh, uh, city's uh, groupment uh, because they have uh, competencies in uh, urban uh, planning construction and uh, agriculture and so uh, and energy also so uh, I think it's um, it's uh, it's a duo between a region regional and uh, cities and the, the two must uh, work uh, together thank you Thomas uh, apologies I didn't understand everything because I lost you but I think you still managed to uh, get the answer to participants so that's the most important um, let's, I'm checking right now. We still don't have any questions in the chat. You can also just uh, turn on your microphone and webcam if you would like to, to ask questions orally, if maybe it's, uh, it's more tricky to, to write it down. But in the meantime, I actually uh, had a question for all our three speakers, because listening to you, I realized, and it was first mentioned by Auti, the importance of data. I think Auti, you were the first one to say, if you want to launch a circular economy initiative, you need to know your data. And in some way, I feel like uh, Thomas, with your urban metabol metabolism of the region, you also had to work on data. And finally, we have seen many maps uh, with, with data with, uh, with Mathieu. So uh, in that order, could you explain me a little bit further if you think that I is maybe one of the first steps to take to launch circular economy initiatives, uh, how you manage to do it? Is all the data always available to you in your organization or is it sometimes tricky for you to, to get them? So Auti, you can go first. Okay, thank you. Uh, tough question, I think, but of course it's I think it's critical to get the data, data uh, but it's not easy and we definitely don't have all the relevant uh, data from our region but we have gathered it from different statistics and made different kind of surveys um, questioned from the from the uh, people that are working in the field for example in the waste management but it takes quite a lot of time and still there is a lot of uncertainties uh, but in general in Finland there is now strong will to improve the um, um, collecting the data what comes to circular economy and there are a lot of research institutions working on that field and actually there was yesterday or is it today a webinar related to these circular economy indicators and we are also being part of that work but still it's sometimes difficult to get the data on a regional level and now we have to remember the differences between these 
regions that we have been discussing today. I think that it has been so nice to hear about the Paris region that you have the same <laughs> same questions that you are talking about the energy and material flows, but you are having 11 million people living there in your region. I don't know uh, how much that is in square kilometers, but we have less than 300 thousand people and the area of our region is about half of the size of the Netherlands. So we really need to uh, know our region and the differences what comes and how we can work on this. But it's still been so nice to hear about all of these presentations that we have similarities but differences. For example, in our region there is no gas grid, so when we are improving biogas production we cannot inject that into the gas grid. But anyway, the data is important. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Aoti. Yeah, I must say it was really great to have the three of you because, as you said, you have a big country but uh, low density of population, then France quite high density of population and very big and then Belgium very small but even uh, still a lot of people so that was that was good for uh, for the participants I don't know in which uh, case you are but you have many uh, examples to uh, to uh, replicate uh, then then Thomas you can you can answer and finally Mathieu Yes, uh, on the data, uh, of course, it's a, a big, uh, a big thing to start a circular economy uh, strategy. But uh, I can say that um, the the research about uh, urban metabolism, we can uh, already see uh, profiles or urban profiles on a circular economy. For, for example, Brussels is almost like Paris, uh, but less uh, inhabitant or London, London is uh, very uh, similar to Paris. So we we already know the the circular economy potential uh, on these uh, cities. But the, the question of data, uh, it's a big question for us because we have uh, several observatories in, uh, in our Paris uh, region. For example, the energy observatory, we have also the waste observatory, we have uh, land observatory. <laughs> Uh, with um, with uh, um, le, le mode d'occupation des sols, the land use uh, observation. We have also uh, the, uh, the, con the concrete and uh, raw materials for construction uh, observatory. And uh, th this, uh, these data, these observatories are very uh, are not related. And I think it's also a big uh, issue of circular economy. It's, it's to, to make the link between waste observatory, between energy observatory, between uh, uh, construction uh, materials. Uh, we, we have to look all these uh, kind of resources. And for that, we have to, to look the data, to, to go uh, mining for data. <laughs> and uh, it's a big project for us, uh, like for uh, during two years, we have um, we have researched all the data. We have uh, we we um, we try to to access to we try to have access to the database uh, a lot uh, a lot of things, and we will uh, soon publish in a, a study on this. So a special report on a resource observatory with the uh, identification the. Uh, um, the data identification uh, soon, but in French. So <laughs> we'll try if we translate it in uh, in English. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Thomas. And yes, there is of course a reason as well. If I'm interested in data, it's because at Federen we've been working on on the topic for uh, for a few years. Uh, we have a network of uh, European observatories and uh, a new project, new project launch on the topic called Energy Watch. So I will make sure to also uh, send that to to participants. And then uh, Mathieu, what is your take on the on the data and maybe how hard or easy was it to create all the those maps for biogas in Belgium? Yes. Um... The first, uh, of course, data are uh, indispensable to, to address the problem uh, because uh, uh, this data uh, 
the, the data that generally exist, I think, are not have not been created in the past into the perspective of developing, for example, circular economy. So we really need we needed at least into this study to uh, aggregate many different sources, uh, maybe 10 different sources, to finally create the first databases on uh, biogas potential. Uh, uh, and this is uh, really the first uh, stone uh, to, to, to build uh, a vision and uh, a proposal to, uh, to, to politics. So, uh, yeah, of course, uh, this is one of the uh, hardest tasks, and it has to be really uh, robust. Uh, otherwise, uh, everything uh, could be uh, uh, contradicted, I mean, uh, uh, counter art uh, to, uh, to unbuild uh, the, the proposed uh, vision. Um. Okay, thank you. Um, and before closing, we still have a uh, Two more questions from Tom. Third question, two, three questions in total from Tom. So uh, you're almost mm -hmm. the second moderator of this webinar. Thank you for your inputs. First one is: um, To what extent the European climate strategies released by the European Commission in the previous weeks will impact Belgian biogas production? So again, a question for you, Mathieu. Yes, thank you. Uh, so I'm not sure of uh, what Tom uh, refers to, uh, if he refers to the Renewable Energy Directive or uh, the something Climate else. Act. Ah, the Green Deal, maybe. Mm -hmm. yeah, the the uh, European Climate Pact is launching next week. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, okay. Maybe. Yeah. To, to be honest, I, I didn't really follow the, this file. Uh, but uh, I really uh, hear about the, 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 the Green Deal, and uh, yes, of course, it gives uh, a good uh, a good room to, to biogas. Um, also, the Renewable Energy Directive uh, has not, uh, I mean, it has left a lot of space to biogas. So I really believe uh, it uh, it uh, it will uh, have a chance to to develop, uh, and it, it will help that. Uh, maybe just uh, I think uh, a, a limit is, for example, for mobility, uh, because until now uh, the European uh, directives uh, compare uh, the mobilities of the vehicles. Uh, still, uh, the emissions uh, at the at the pipe are considered, and uh, that, uh, for example, is a big problem for biomethane, because even if biomethane is CO2 neutral. Uh, of course, when it is burned, it rejects CO2, the same CO2 that will be used by the plant into the photosynthesis uh, after. But at the end, uh, because of this way of considering things, uh, these European directives are uh, rejecting uh, the biomethane role into uh, mobility. Uh, and at the same time, they consider uh, electrical vehicle is a zero emission. Uh, without considering uh, the way the electricity was produced uh, and, and not even the, the way to produce batteries. So there is really, to our feeling, uh, an unfair uh, way uh, of proposing um, some criteria. Thank you, Mathieu. That's really interesting. And you actually answered, I think, the, the second question was uh, another formulation of the, the one I just asked. So now um, I think we've addressed a lot of uh, different aspects of the topic. Uh, I would just like to uh, to end maybe with uh, the last input for, from um, Thomas and, and Auti. If you have any final remarks, something you wanted to add that you didn't get the chance to address in your presentation, you can uh, do it now. Uh, so let's first go with uh, Thomas and then Auti. Uh, um. Not a special word because I, I think I said uh, everything I wanted to say. So uh, maybe just uh, try to look at your own uh, urban metabolism and try to 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 seek to a better systemic uh, vision of resources. Thank you, Auti. Mm, nothing special. But I want to thank you all for this possibility to be here today and it has been very inspiring to listen all of these presentations and I, I hope to hear you also afterwards. Thank you. Uh, Melissa, can I add one last thing? Of course. 
Yes, uh, j just a word uh, now, and I think the biogas is into the same challenge than circular economy, because now the challenge for biogas, biogas is more expensive to produce than natural gas. Uh, fossil alternative is cheaper. And so uh, now the, the real challenge, uh, the real uh, enjeu, uh, I, I don't know in, in, in English, uh, is to prove that the externality, the positive externalities that biogas will bring uh, are uh, worth uh, the development of the biogas. Uh, to prove these externalities uh, worth the money that uh, the governments will need to, to support the biogas. And I feel maybe into the circular economy the challenge could be a little bit the same. Sometimes the circular economy will not be more, let's say, profitable on economic indicators, but the challenge is to uh, be able to calculate uh, how much the multiple uh, benefits uh, could represent, uh, sometimes very difficult to uh, estimate, and uh, at the end to demonstrate that it is a real uh, investment for the future. Thank you very much. This was really some uh, inspiring messages uh, and I, I think, I hope that uh, our participants will be inspired to take on some new uh, circular economy and biogas initiatives following this webinar. Thank you again to, to the three of you. Uh, I'm, I'm sure, uh, at least for me, it was very interesting and uh, I hope to see you all at our next and final circular economy webinar next year, which will take place on the 9th of February. Um, and as I said, this was the last webinar of the year. So I wish you all a Merry Christmas, a Happy New Year, even though uh, the situation is still uh, very uncertain in most countries. I hope you can all enjoy it and come back next year ready to, uh, to take on the challenge of the energy transition. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a nice day. Goodbye. Goodbye.